May my words be in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Please sit down. <clears throat> Happy Easter. I know we're on the fifth Sunday of Eastertide here, but did you know that most of the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox churches are celebrating Easter Day today? They follow a different calendar from us, the Julian one, rather than the Gregorian one that we follow. And it's complicated. But if you want to know more about it, my husband John will be happy to explain. He's read books about it and is very knowledgeable. Well, Jesus himself wrote no books and he left no buildings or monuments. What he did was far greater. He built a community. He said to his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. This was the image he used in talking about the community that he had founded with his heavenly father as the vine dresser. It's a simple yet profound illustration of unity, closeness, and interdependence. And how our spiritual life flourishes when it knows its dependence on Christ and trusts in God the Father to tend us. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was often likened to a vine. In Psalm 80, the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt is described in terms of a vine being transplanted from the soil of Egypt to that of Canaan. In Isaiah, the nation Israel is likened to a vineyard that does not produce fruit. In Jeremiah, Israel is described as a vine that is sending out degenerate shoots. Over and over again, Israel was referred to as a vine. The vine had become the symbol of the nation Israel. It was on Jewish coins in the Maccabean period. And in Jesus' lifetime on earth, there was a huge filigree of a vine adorning the entrance to Herod's temple that everyone would see when they came to worship. So the vine was a hugely important symbol for the Jews. But Jesus said he was the true vine. In other words, not like the old Israel. And St. Paul in Romans 11 says that we Gentile believers are grafted into the true vine. When Jesus painted his word picture of the vine and the branches and his father as the vine dresser, he knew what he was talking about. The vine was grown all over Palestine and still is. It's a plant which needs a great deal of attention if the best fruit is to be got from it. Much more attention than the other two main trees in Palestine, the fig tree and the olive tree. For the vine, careful preparation of the soil is needed and then it grows abundantly and at speed, and drastic pruning is necessary. I learned this the hard way, both with a real vine and as an analogy for my spiritual life. Forty years ago, I moved to a new house and inherited a grapevine in a greenhouse, but I knew nothing about how to look after it so I left it the first year to see what would happen. Well, it grew and grew, but did not have many grapes. So I thought I'd leave it alone for another year to give it a chance to produce more fruit. Well, as you might guess, that didn't work. It had lots of spindly growth right through the roof of the greenhouse, but only a few bunches of very small grapes. So I read a book. And with trepidation, I did what it said. I pruned the vine hard, back to its stump. 
and waited anxiously through the winter to see whether it could possibly recover. And it did. It thrived and produced masses of bunches of grapes. But the learning was not over. I then made the further mistake of not being able to bear to thin out the grapes as they grew, resulting in masses of the tiniest grapes ever. I had to learn to thin them out so that the remaining ones could have room to flourish. But in a sense, I had to learn that lesson in my own spiritual life too. There was a time when I was trying to do too much in my own strength. I was a single parent, a counsellor, a spiritual director. I had several part-time jobs to pay the rent. Then I became an ordinand on top of all that. And in the stress of it all, I began to squeeze the time I spent in prayer. After all, surely God wouldn't mind. He could see how busy I was. And it was all important stuff and all for God. Thankfully, I had a wise spiritual director who pointed out that the harder I worked in my own strength, the less fruitful I was becoming. Too many straggly weak branches and too many little grapes. A hard lesson, but I've not forgotten it. In our own strength, we can do very little. And if we are to bear fruit, we need to be fed and strengthened by the sap of the vine. Or as Jesus puts it, we need to abide in him. In spring, the branches of the vine teem with life in the form of leaves and blossoms. In the autumn, the branches are loaded with grapes, but they can only produce their fruit because they're connected to the vine. Cut off from the vine, the branches would quickly wither and die. And if they're not pruned, they would be weak and less fruitful. Sap flows from the vine to the branch, supplying it with water, minerals, and nutrients that make it grow. And the sap, if you like, is the Holy Spirit. And we're completely dependent upon Jesus and the Holy Spirit for everything that counts as spiritual fruit. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And if you think about it, the secret of Jesus' own life was his continuous contact with God, his heavenly Father. Again and again, he withdrew into a solitary place to meet with him, connect with him, to be filled with his grace and strength. So we must be connected to Jesus, the vine. And it doesn't just happen. We have to take deliberate steps to do it, to pray. And I think especially first thing in the day as we get up, so that there's never a day when we give our, ourselves chance to forget him. And also, before we go to bed, we can recall our day and give thanks for the times we felt God's presence, and then ask his help to reset for the next day. So just as the branches need the vine, we need Christ. Separated from him, we have no abundant life, and are unable to bear fruit. But this community which Jesus founded is two-way. The vine needs the branches because it's the branches that produce the fruit. And Christ needs us. We are Christ's hands and feet in the world. And together with Christ, connected to Christ, we form a unity. We may feel inadequate about our part of the enterprise, but we need only remember that it's only if we cut ourselves off or separate ourselves or fail to stay connected that we shall wither and fail to produce fruit. Jesus did not ask us to be successful, but he did ask us to be fruitful. During the winter months, the branches are pruned, and pruning is a painful process 
for a fruit tree, but the aim of the surgery is not to inflict pain, but to remove suckers and excess shoots which use up the goodness but produce nothing. And that helps the tree to produce better fruit. We too need some pruning. There are probably things that are useless and perhaps, perhaps even harmful in our lives which sap our energy and diminish our spiritual fruitfulness. But it isn't just about the flourishing of our own personal spiritual lives. We are a community connected and dependent on Christ the vine, but also connected and dependent on each other because we're fellow branches, not just here at St. Faith's, but also in our diocese. Our diocese, which is going through a time of severe challenge and, dare I say, painful pruning at the moment as a result of COVID and its impact on finances. This reorganization is happening throughout the diocese, but in a sense, it's, it's not touching us at St. Faith's here so much yet. And perhaps we might be tempted to say, well, that's okay then, we can be thankful that all, all will carry on just as before. But I think that might well be wrong. And I want to use the analogy of the vaccine. Glad you've had yours, Paul. But, but we seem to be okay in the UK at the moment. But then if we think of India and other places, the terrible suffering they're going through because of lack of vaccines, lack of oxygen, lack of other medication. I know we're all praying for help for India and a fairer share of oxygen and vaccines and medication. And we certainly cannot be complacent while our fellow human beings, beloved children of God just like us, are in such dire circumstances. And in a similar though less obvious way perhaps, we must not be complacent when our fellow branches in our deanery and diocese are facing changes that look as if they may well involve painful cuts. We're currently without a shepherd and an assistant shepherd, the bishop and the archdeacon have gone. And so the huge burden of decision-making, pruning if you like, and planning, falls on our remaining archdeacons the Bishop's Council, the Synod, and the area deans, of which Paul is one. So they need our prayers for wisdom and integrity as they plan for a different future, and as they try to cope compassionately with the fears of congregations losing their clergy, and clergy losing their livelihoods and their homes. We need to pray for all the branches of the vine, that they will be able to trust the vine dresser, stay connected to Christ the vine, and withstand the severe pruning, and hopefully grow back better and stronger with new life after this COVID pandemic. And let us pray too that we will find ways of personally staying connected to the vine so that within the company of Christ's pilgrim people, we may daily be renewed by his grace and bear much fruit to the glory of God. Amen.